everyone and welcome to Straight Talk for tonight's online community forum. I'm Pam Duncan. I'm the president and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. Tonight's conversation is now the 47th in a series of discussions which started last year. We hold weekly conversations around important topics that are impacting the communities of Tacoma and Pierce County. Tonight's conversation is extremely timely. We're digging in into the work that's being done in our community to try to ensure people can remain in their homes when Washington's state eviction moratorium comes to an end. Right now, that's scheduled to happen June 30th. I'd like to remind everyone the most important message that we can convey throughout the series of conversations is that there is hope for our community. We would like at this point to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is being conducted on the indigenous lands of the Puyallup people. We gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Seed language. Thank you, Rob. Throughout today's conversation, if you're listening in live, you can submit questions to it be addressed by our speakers using the Q&A function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will have time to consider every question, but we'll give it our darn best try. Now, I would like to introduce our guests for tonight's discussion. Michael Mira is the executive director of the Tacoma Housing Authority. He has been in this role for the last 17 years, and he announced earlier this year that he will retire from THA on July 5th. Michael, thank you for being here tonight. And on behalf of everyone in our community, we thank you so much for your service that you have provided leading THA and also being an advocate for those we serve throughout the community for the last 17 years. Welcome and thank you, Michael. Marilise Hood Kwan is the executive director of the Center for Dialogue and Resolution. She is a certified mediator and she holds a BA in International Relations and Conflict Management and is a Juris Doctorate. Marilise, thank you so much for making the time to be here this evening. And thank you for all you do in our community. Last and certainly not least, we have Lori Davenport in this important conversation who serves as the Director of Development and Outreach for Tacoma Pro Bono. Lori, we certainly extend a heartfelt um, thanks to you as well for everything that you are doing, as well as Tacoma Pro Bono during these very challenging times. I'm so glad to have all of you here. This is like a powerhouse of information. And I also must acknowledge my gratitude to Rob Huff, who serves as our weekly producer. Thank you so much, Rob. And in her absence, Amanda Westbrook, who is a little under the weather to this evening um, and is not able to be here. So I have, I get the honor and privilege of opening up the conversation the way that Amanda typically would do. And that's um, just to check in on everyone to see how you're doing. And the question that Amanda is so good for asking is how is your heart? And we leave this open for anyone to just jump in and begin speaking. I'm gonna jump in. It looked like you were gonna talk, Michael, but I'll give you 30 more seconds to think it through. I'm um, struggling with having the, uh, balancing my energy um, in the sense of I wanna be mindful and thoughtful of the struggle that recovery 
is going to require of each and every one of us. And it feels like we've been in crisis management for 15 months, which is more about just taking care of what's urgent, what's urgent. And right now we have the chance to begin rebuilding or to build a society and a community where we take care of each other, where we base on what are our needs, not what is our privilege. And I find that I can easily spend way too much time worrying about that and losing my effectivity. So I'm working hard on balance. That's how I'm showing up today. That was good. That was a good reminder too for everyone. Thank you, Mayor Elise. I like Pam's emphasis on hope. She has actually been the community leader hoping to have a widespread recognition that we may be headed for a communal disaster with the end of the eviction moratorium that we should prepare for and address as a community. It's a notable example of Pam's leadership. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Michael. I guess I'm feeling um, energized in a kind of a panicky way. Um, kind of like I'm hovering over the top of things and seeing all these different things that are happening, could happen, might happen, might not happen, what can I do? And uh, nervous that I'll forget about something while I'm concentrating on something else. It's kind of like that. I'm not even finding, I'm not getting anywhere near balance. It's just uh, <laughs> kind of floating. I'm sure none of us can relate to what you're talking about, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> no it's like every day. How about you, Rob? I'm feeling a little bit on edge as well, um, but I'm hopeful. I, th I, I really appreciate everybody being here to talk about this topic. And um, I'm hoping that we can give the community some hope as they're looking at a tenuous time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point to segue um, into the questions we have. The statewide eviction moratorium is currently scheduled to end on June 30th. Mayor Elise and Lori, what are your expectations about what is likely to happen for tenants who are behind on their rent and at risk of being evicted? Lori's organization and the Center for Dialogue and Resolution have been worrying about reaching out to tenants in these incredibly difficult times for over 12 months now. We actually got a grant in July. And um, I hate to say it, with all the energy and the focus, we still have not reached tenants to the sense that they trust the idea that if you apply for rental assistance, the state the county, the cities have funds available to pay back rent. We've been working on this for a whole year and I recognize, and so what my call is to anyone watching live or the recording, at this moment, it is in your hands, members of the community, people who go to church with you, as you begin to re interact with other people and you hear people talk about nervous about paying rent, please not only give them help or hope, but give them the link to the rental assistance application. Hold their hands. When you are in crisis, you don't think straight. And when it says, give us why you're unemployment, help them figure out how to tell the story that COVID means they have less income, therefore have been unable to pay rent. And to the small landlords who are just at home nervous and thinking about selling their property, you hold in your hands generational wealth and the county and the city have funds to help you. So my biggest call is to members of our community. We've got three weeks before the moratorium is set to lift. Please use every moment you can to support members that you know in our community who could use some help. And if the moratorium is not lifted, I think with the same urgency, we need every single person who considers any one of our organizations a crucial organization to do that personal handholding, to recognize in times of trauma, we need our support people with us and that you step up and help. And I'm hoping that Rob can put the rental assistance link up so that people can find that. And all of us should be familiar. 
it's gobbledygook unless you have a law degree like Michael, but it's easy to understand if you really are calmly read through it and help people. So my biggest fear is tenants will walk away without getting that help. That landlords will be so frustrated that they'll cut off the communication and ask someone to leave. And if that happens, there's no rental assistance. And I hand it off to you, Lori. Yeah, we, we do not think it's gonna be extended. I know a lot of a lot of people in organizations are pushing that direction, but we're also pushing in a different direction. Things are opening up. Um, everything is changing. We've been doing this for over a year. Landlords need money. Uh, we need need to start facing it. I, I think it's going to end on June 30th. So that's an important message to get out there because that makes everything you have just said even more important. And hopefully, we'll make some people think about that and try to get some help. And I think the thing that's really important just to get in mind is, I mean, people are afraid that it ends June 30th, therefore I will be on the street July 1st. That is not going to happen. People have been working on this for months to try to keep that from happening. As far as, um, you know, we don't know how many there are gonna be. We don't know the, if the size of the wave is gonna be hundreds of thousands or, 20,000 or we just don't know, but it's gonna be a wave whether it's big or small, but that does not mean your stuff will be out on the street July 1st. It takes a long time for evictions to happen. We have the eviction resolution program with the Center for Dialogue and Resolution that has to happen. People have to go through that before anybody can be evicted. So apply for rental assistance, get in touch with CDR, get in touch with Tacoma Pro Bono. There's plenty of time now and after the moratorium ends, plenty of time. So Lori, thank you for that. And you mentioned, uh, you acknowledge that there is an effort underway right now for the governor to extend the, um, the deadline yet again. And you may mentioned that you don't expect that would happen. Would another month or two make any difference? The people I've spoken to uh, really don't think it would because, because partly because we have this status quo where um, people aren't, aren't doing anything until they actually have to. And, you know, I think we've just gone about as far as we can with the good that the moratorium can do because we now have other protections in place. I mean, as of July 1, tenants have right to counsel. Tenants have, we have, you know, just cause eviction. We have um, ERP, the eviction resolution program working in the counties that have 80% of the evictions in the state. So we've built a lot of stuff that is gonna help. It's not like we were just kind of waiting for everything to drop. People have been working on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it would do that much good personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for that. And the, uh, the message that I hear stemming from what you are saying is, um, if that applies to you, you're watching this, you're listening, you're watching a recording, or you know someone, don't wait. Don't wait. Um, and as you've mentioned, and I want to acknowledge for everyone who has been a part of this, there has been much that has been accomplished and we cannot let perfection be the enemy of the good. Um, and so thank you for highlighting that, Lori. Did you want to say something, Marilise? I did. I want to add that another partner that we have in this is the, the superior court, which is where a landlord would go make a filing to be able to evict. And so hopefully hearing that you can't do that July 1 will calm some people down because the eviction ends and it feels like you're going to have that. And I just want to highlight when, when um, Lori says go to the center, what our superior court judge and commissioners who are ready to do is they will accept the filing, but their first question is going to be, did you go to the center and have a conversation? Did you apply for rental assistance? And has that been considered? So I can't promise you 100%. But I can tell you that our courts are going to be gracious with a timeline as long as people take action and apply for the rental assistance, sign up at the Center for Dialogue and Resolution. It could be conflict coaching how to talk to your landlord. It could just be a couple phone calls. You don't even have to meet for a mediation to be able to resolve that. And our hope is we're dealing with back rental. 
We're assuring that towards the future, you can afford the new rental, the, the, what your rent is and stay abreast, but also repair that relationship landlord tenant that has been so tense during the moratorium. And so when we say the Center for Dialogue and Resolution, I want to highlight the amazing volunteers who've been training to hold these difficult and powerful conversations. And until that happens, the court will not see, take the filing to be able to evict someone. And that's an important first step when, when we say eviction resolution project. Thank you, Pam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's pivot, Michael. You are in a unique position as an advocate for low income and affordable housing, and also the leader of an organization that provides housing to many people. What can you add from a housing provider perspective? The Tacoma Housing Authority is the largest residential landlord in the area, but we're in a special position in that uh, our job is to subsidize rents of the people we house. And we increased our subsidy as their incomes went down because of the pandemic. So I don't count our tenant population as the primary worry here. And we also have very good relations with Marilise and Lori's systems that we know how to direct our tenants to get help. So in that respect, our, our tenants are the lucky ones. I am worried about the vast majority of Pierce County renters who do not get any subsidy, who are not plugged into social service systems and who may actually regard the courts and social services as unfamiliar and unfriendly territory. Marilise and Lori are right that Pierce County has built some impressive safeguards, safeguards that we have been hoping for for a long time. Tenant protections that are now embedded into state law, rental assistance in amounts that we have never seen before. And come the end of the eviction moratorium, we're gonna find out the big answer, whether it makes a difference. And if it doesn't, we may see a measure of, dis, of um, displacement that we have never before seen. And that is what is at the crux of the matter. It is really um, our holding our collective breaths because of the um, enormity of the impact um, that we aren't even able to quite quantify at this yeah. point. I'd like to emphasize something Marilee said because it's an important point and it's addressed to landlords. So if a landlord has a tenant who's behind on the rent come July 1st, the new rules does not allow an eviction to proceed unless the landlord can show some adequate effort to consult this new system we've got. But I'm hoping that most landlords will recognize their own self-interest to seek this help because they've got a judgment to make between Evicting somebody, not getting any rental assistance for the rent arrearage, putting up with a vacancy when they get no rent from anybody else, and betting they're going to find a, a, a new tenant soon enough to, to resume rent payments. All that are bets. In contrast, what Marilise and Lori's programs are offering is money to pay rent arrearages to keep a family in place paying rent with a reasonable prospect of rebuilding a relationship with a tenant for future rent payments. And I'm hoping a lot of landlords will find that to be appealing. That's 
also a good point that you brought up about um, hedging your bets, you know, expecting, thinking, hoping, betting that you will get someone else in. And when you consider that if there is a, um, a, a huge wave of evictions to, to coin the term we heard earlier, a lot of the folks who are applying for other housing are the folks who have already, who have been evicted. So, um, and based on the criteria that would be utilized to determine someone's eligibility if they have an eviction, or even if the landlord suspects that they left out of their unit and went to another one, that's just um, sunk costs and time for everyone. So I, I, I'm saying that to concur with what you're saying, Michael, that this is an opportunity to really build the relationships with the existing tenants. Mm -hmm. So last year in late summer and fall, um, each of you participated in meetings that MDC convened and worked with uh, Mayor Lees and well, you all were part of this, um, to talk about what our community can do to limit the impact when the eviction moratorium ends. Um, we've talked a little, you've talked about how you think um, our community is prepared to help people. How do we factor in the help of the state laws that were passed during the uh, legislative, the 2021 legislative session, as well as the addition of more rental assistance uh, through federal and state funding resources. So long question, how well do you feel we are prepared as a community? I'm going to go first because I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I have to leave early from this, from this group. And um, I believe it was educating policymakers on the size of the problem and the size of the amount of money to be given. Um, so I think that we have unspent rental assistance that is sort of backed up and we need to open up those that channel of, of and get as many people through the system. Um, and that's kind of what I'd like to say is get in line first to make sure before it runs out. But I actually believe our policymakers have done a lot, both at the state legislature, in our county, and in our cities to be able to do that. And then we have some additional federal funds. Um, this solves past rent. What One of the questions that I thought came up in the MDC conversation is, what are we doing to protect who owns those rentals that are being done for rentals? Who is actually, is that generational wealth? I live on the hilltop, so I... I have people on my front lawn who are camping, and I also know a lot of families who just couldn't hold on to their property, which was a second income. So um, are we doing enough to support our community members to keep the wealth, to keep that land close within us? And so I think there's more conversation to be had as we invest this money. Right now, as I said, I'm looking for the balance of how do we rebuild an equitable system while we deal with the crisis. What's in front of us is get the rental assistance out, which will help landlords because it's paying them back money that they need desperately to manage their buildings. Um, my hope is, and I believe that there are important people, Michael being one of them, thinking about how what is the housing stock and how do that we keep that in our community. So I would say um, cash wise for rental, past rental, we've probably got the money we need for investing and ensuring longevity and keeping the wealth amongst Tacomans and people in Pierce County. We've probably got some work to do, but I think we actually have public policy that is going to support us to be able to do that. That's my hopeful hope. Your hopeful hope. Thank you, Mayor Elise. Um, and I know that you may just wave in, at any point and have to um, poof, disappear off the, the screen. And um, we thank you for the time that you've made to uh, be on the call and just check your chat. And then, um, Michael or, and uh, Lori, your response to that question. Hmm. I'll go. Mary Lee's referred to this um, a little bit, but it needs some emphasis. There really 
there's a companion crisis in the rental market ownership. And there are a lot of landlords, in particular small ones, under great stress. And the worry is that more of that portfolio will pass into speculative ownership. That's what happened after the Great Recession, mm -hmm. when um, significant parts of Tacoma's housing market through foreclosure passed into ownership by financial institutions or real estate investment funds. And there are real estate investment funds with ready cash looking for bargains to purchase, that would not be a positive trend for our rental market. And we must count this as the companion to the stress tenants are, are facing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know there are a lot of people working on, we, we don't anywhere near have enough housing. <laughs> And I just, I applaud all the people who are working on that. It has to happen and we really have to keep our, our eyes on it. Um, what we do is we tend to focus on how the system can help people, individual people conquer some of the barriers that either are, you know, getting them evicted or keeping them from getting into housing. And so that's kind of one of the things we're focusing on is what happens if you get evicted? What happens if your housing right now is kind of temporary or tentative? Um, it's really difficult for people who have things on their record to get into housing. And that's, we are trying to prevent that from getting worse and worse and worse. People who have, and the law, um, the law that was recently passed 5160 does extend some of the protections that people have from getting, you know, having evictions put on their record and being reported to the agencies that report to landlords. So some of that is, is built into the recent legislation and that's good. And we're working really hard to try to get to people who do have stuff on their record, people who need that removed, who need help with that so that they can actually get into something. So that's one of the things we're focusing on. The other thing, of course, <clears throat> is that we are now participating in right to counsel, which is huge. And um, I can't tell you how enormous that is. Um, Michael knows, I think any of us who've ever worked in legal aid or like, would something like this ever happen? And it did. And Washington's the first state to have this. So um, that's enormous because that gives us, um, we're not just a struggling little legal aid agency, we're we're hiring 12 attorneys to do this work. Mm -hmm. So that means not just attorneys, but you know, people who answer the phone, um, it just means we're gonna be bigger in the community. So there's, there's a lot there um, and we just have to, we really have to try to make it work for individual people and then work on the, big, the bigger basis of you know, how can we build and acquire low income housing? How can we keep ownership in the community it all has to be happening at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to pause here and say, if you are just joining in uh, to this conversation, we are having a very important discussion about the uh, pending end to the eviction moratorium, which is at this point slated to be June 30th. And uh, we have on the call now, Michael Mira, and Lori Davenport, we are just talking about what the ending of the moratorium means for those who are um, behind on their rent. And we've said this already, if you know someone, um, if it's you or if it's someone, a family friend or whoever um, who is at risk of being evicted, to uh, please uh, get in touch with uh, several, there's several different places. There's the Pierce County Rental Assistance, there's the Center for Dialogue and Resolution, and there is Tacoma Pro Bono. We have that contact information posted in the chat. And at the end of this conversation, we will also just um, provide everyone with some telephone numbers if you need those. We've talked about um, what the potential, what the end looks like 
At this point, we are expecting it to be June 30th. And we've talked about this. I would like for uh, you, Lori, to just reiterate, what steps should people be taking now to ensure that they won't be subject to an eviction? So people should, um, first of all, we, we've talked about this quite a bit, realize that that the help is there and that they can, they can contact Center for Dialogue and Resolution. They can go through the website to get rental assistance. They can contact our program if they have issues or don't know what to do. Um, all of us have um, the ability to guide people through stuff. Do it, you know, take advantage of it. Don't assume that you, don't assume that there isn't help out there and don't assume that you don't have rights. I mean, that's, that's our main message. You have a right to get help. Nothing is gonna to happen to you immediately, but if you can get started talking to people who can give you help, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really important. I think it's also really important to um, understand some things. Um, for instance, if, you're, if you are on a lease, the, that lease when it ends, if it ends like at, at the end of June at the same time the moratorium is over, that doesn't mean that you can get evicted just because your lease is over. Your lease converts to month to month and you will not be evicted just because it's over and you don't, don't leave because then you won't be eligible for rental assistance. Um, if you have a question about stuff like that, if you're having a dispute with your landlord and you think that your landlord will, won't cooperate with you to work on a payment plan, um, contact us, contact Center for Dialogue and Resolution. Um, you could be wrong. There's enough, what we're seeing because we've been, you know, in court working with landlords and tenants all this time on different issues. Um, people don't, if they can't see each other, they don't trust each other. This pandemic has been hard on everybody. Um, tenants don't have money, landlords don't have money. It's tough. And if, if the tenant is not complying with all the rules of the rental agreement, that's going to make things worse. If the landlord is doing things that the tenant sees as harassment, that's going to make things worse. Mm -hmm. Tempers are really high. So I think it's important to recognize that, have some empathy if you're a tenant for the landlord and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And remember what everybody's going through and try to work it out and try to stay where you are. Mm -hmm. Michael. I would have um, advice for both tenants and landlords to talk to each other. That, uh, that can be scary, but a landlord is less likely to evict a tenant if the landlord thinks the tenant is making an effort to find this assistance. A tenant is more likely to seek the assistance with the assurance from the landlord that the landlord will cooperate. And if they talk to each other, they may actually find they have the same interest in seeking that assistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good work, Michael. I was uh, thinking as Lori was speaking, um, actually some of the very things that you said, if, um, if I'm a tenant and I have raised my concerns about things in my unit, you know, especially repeatedly, I might be fearful that the landlord is going to use this as an opportunity to get me out. Um, and a landlord may feel that and might be anticipating someone thinking that way as well. So um, what you just said, Michael, is so critical and we can't emphasize that enough for the two parties to talk with one another. Again, to reach out to Center for Dialogue and Resolution. That phone number in Pierce County is 253-572-3657. Uh, so, Let's, let's pivot. We don't know um, the exact number, but let's just kind of talk about how many people do we believe um, may be at risk. And just to talk about some of the numbers that we've heard to give folks an idea of what that might look like. Um, either of you able to talk about just like from your perspective, 
what that might be, the number of folks. We were talking just before this, um, we went live, you know, we were saying we don't, we're not certain if it's going to be a small wave or a big wave, but we know it's a wave. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Um, I guess the last thing I read was, I think in the Seattle Times, it's, and, and it was um, census pulse data that like 160,000 households in Washington are behind on rent. I, um, I don't think anyone has seen any specific Pierce County numbers, um, but we've heard, I think when the governor did his latest extension of the eviction moratorium, he said something like 76,000. I heard from somebody else, 250,000. It's, um, we've had this conversation many, many, many times and it, it's all over the place. It's very difficult to predict. Um, we know um, when they started talking about what do we need for right to counsel, um, they were basing it on eviction data from 2016. Um, and we're looking at, um, I mean, the workload is looking pretty fantastic right now. So, and again, that's all over the place. So um, we don't know, but we know that it's gonna be big. And, and remember, um, I, we're talking about all these things in terms of um, people who owe rent. And I, I think bringing up the idea that people can be evicted for other reasons is, is really important as well, because it's confusing. A lot of these protections are there, you know, the rental assistance, the uh, eviction resolution program, all that stuff that's predicated on it being um, a non-payment of rent case. But there are a lot of cases are going to be happening that are not non-payment of rent cases. They're so-and-so is smoking in the unit the whole time and I'm going to evict them. Um, that's a little different. That's where the other protections come in, the just cause and the right to counsel. And that's really different than it was before. And that's going to prevent, it's going to prevent a lot of the tsunami effect that ever, I'm sure has taken place in everybody's mind that we just can't handle this and people are going to be on the street. Those things will really make a difference. I mean, the landlord has, there are, I think, 17 different just causes that we use to evict people um, outside of the, you know, good reasons that there are. Um, right to counsel means that you're going to get time. If you're eligible, you're going to be screened. You're going to be assigned an attorney. That's all going to take time. And like, um, Mary, I'm grateful to Marilise for mentioning that the Superior Court here in Pierce County is our wonderful partner in leaning over backwards to make sure that justice is done, things get done right. Lori, one of the hopes is that the mediation and referral system will divert cases away from the court. But if this large amount of cases end up in court, is the court ready for it? I think so. Um, I don't think anybody knows exactly what it's gonna look like yet, but we have been, again, talking about this for a long time. I'm working on it for a long time. I think we're ready. I think we're ready to, one of the things that's been talked about is um, just limiting how many unlawful detainer, which is what an eviction is called by lawyers, um, how many of those cases can be heard every week? I mean, right now, we, uh, the court hears them or in normal times, heard them five days a week, and we have been having hearings five days a week. It's, it's been busy. They may change that. They may just limit the number of hearings that they can hold, um, spread things out. So we're working with them very closely mm -hmm. on how to do that. So. I think we're ready and we'll, we'll be ready with right to counsel by July 1. Will the show cause hearing in an unlawful detainer happen in person or remotely? Again, we don't know for sure. We think it'll be a mix or as a hybrid is what they're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So you are using language that perhaps a lot of folks who are listening in don't understand what that means when you say show cause and for a motion um, and detainer and um, even talking about some of the uh, recent bills that got passed. So how about if we just kind of break that down for folks as well? Sorry, Pam. 
the show cause hearing is the court hearing that um, courts host. It's the landlord's chance to get an order of eviction without further proceeding. It's meant to be fast, pretty informal. And I was asking Lori whether that would happen in person or in some virtual fashion that people would talk to each other on the screen. Okay. A virtual kind of court proceeding is its own challenge. Yes. It, it's, it's assuming that people have access to the appropriate technology. It's assuming they could use it effectively. And that's an uncertainty for people because of language or disability or just lack of resources. And people who are already unfamiliar or uncomfortable in court speaking up may not be too comfortable speaking up on the screen. Yeah, I, I'm just uh, thinking about also what Lori said about perhaps the way that that caseload gets handled will be very different, which will also make things take a lot more time than if there are hearings five days a week. I was just thinking, thinking about like what that docket must, might look like. Um, so we've talked about this in a lot of different ways. I wanna ask it um, again. Uh, if people do receive eviction notices, what should they do? Now, first of all, that notice will, will have, the first notice they receive um, for, for a non-payment of rent case will have, um, actually for any case now, because things, things will have changed. Um, it's gonna have resource information on it. It's gonna say, con you know, get legal help, contact Tacoma Pro Bono, get help from Di Center for Dialogue and Resolution, contact them, and that's, that's, that's it. For non-payment of rent cases, that has to happen before anything else can, can go ahead. And there are a couple of notices involved in those cases. So um, it's always better to, you know, the first notice you get to take that action. We don't necessarily know that everybody will, but that's what needs to happen. The information's all there on the notice. The notice does not mean you're gonna be evicted the next day. It doesn't mean that there's nothing you can do. It needs, need to read it. I guess that's the first thing, <laughs> read and respond. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you haven't already, talk to your landlord. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about our community as a whole. What are the biggest things that our community should be doing right now to avoid the worst possible impacts of the eviction moratorium ending? I think... Um, <clears throat> I loved what Mary Lee said at the outset. Um, it, if you know anyone or overhear anyone or can think of anyone who might be in this situation where they're stuck, have a <clears throat> rent that they, have, that they can't pay, are afraid they're gonna be evicted, help them get connected, make it, make it possible for them, do whatever you think is necessary, um, I think, it's, it's like, it's similar to what we've, what we've gone through with vaccines. It's just taken a long time and it's, you know, it takes a long time for it to be out there, but um, give people a chance to trust it. They have, we have to give them a chance to trust the system. For, for me, that's one of the biggest things is that people, people don't trust. Um, if you know someone who's a refugee or an immigrant, they're gonna be very hesitant to come forward our organization doesn't have any restrictions on helping people. We don't ask. We never, of course, turn anybody over to anyone. We've, um, we're funded to help. This is not something where if you get involved with the legal system, you're going to be turned over to someone or we're going to discover warrants in your past. If we discover a warrant in your past, we're going to help you get rid of it. So um, anything you can do, I think, to create trust because 
know, we've worked hard, the legislature's worked hard. Um, this, this, a lot of what's been built is there for, for people, regular people. Let's stay in this space for a moment because you brought up a lot of good points, Lori. We've been having this conversation just on the basic premise of someone is behind in their rent, right? No other issues. And we know that there is, um, there's bound to be uh, multiple intersections of different things that are going on because people, life happens. So um, someone could be here without, you know, the papers that they, that support them being um, legally here. They could have outstanding warrants. They could just be behind on a lot of other stuff and concerned that, oh, this is the point. This is going to be the space where I get called out about every single thing that I owe, that I was supposed to do, and I haven't done. And I just am going to be quiet and just stay in my house and not call anybody. So it's also acknowledging all of the layers of things that people, um, with which people contend on a daily basis. And it's, um, it's you, what you just expressed, Lori, is um, like the, the metaphor of, uh, of a lighthouse that's just like shining this beacon. And it's like, it's okay. It's like, we're here, it's okay. You can come to us. So I want to um, express appreciation for elevating that. Thank you. Yeah, we we really we are a safe place. Center for Dialogue and Resolution is a safe place mm -hmm. for everyone. Thank you, uh, Michael. Did you have anything that you wanted to add before I go to our next question? Um, if, as your your question presumes, the worst happens. We're going to get a big reminder on how so many other civic systems don't work unless people have a place to live. And the consequences will show in emergency services, the child welfare system, the mental health system, public health. It'll show in the, um, the city's struggle with street homelessness. That will get worse. The shelter system already overburdened will become even more so. Pam, if the worst happens, we are not ready for it. So this is anticipating your last question, which is cause for hope. I think the system that Lori and Marilise are describing is a crucial preventative. Redirecting people and landlords into discussions and assistance available to keep people in their home, to keep cases out of the courts, that presently I think is our best bet. So good, good place to ask this question which is my next to the last question. In our conversations with housing providers during the meetings that were convened last year, and even in conversations since then, we all know this, we've heard that one of the biggest challenges is opening lines of communications between housing providers and the tenants. That's like the big thing. Um, what can we do to get both sides talking to each other? so that we can find mutually beneficial ways to move forward. I think of this as a marketing challenge that Lori and Marilise have something valuable to offer to both tenants and landlords. The challenge is to help them understand that advantage and, and to use it. Yeah, and get all the information out there that's that's important for both um, landlords need to know that <clears throat> there's a fund to help them. If for yeah. instance, their tenant never responds to a notice, never does anything, and they're just behind thousands of dollars, I believe it's up to $15,000 they can get from that landlord fund, which is run through the Department of Commerce. 
um, there is just a lot out there for people. So yeah, it's a marketing challenge, big, big time marketing challenge. Absolutely. Laurie, we do have the advantage that a landlord has to go to court in order to evict. And the system will force the landlord and the tenant into that discussion in order for that case to proceed. So although the the turnout so far is disappointing. Maybe it will um, get better as landlords realize that. The main danger is the one we were speaking of before is that tenants will walk away without even giving it a chance and evict themselves. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have because people are, um, Pam, you said it really well. I mean, people are feeling constant pressure from every direction. And it's almost like, hey, you know, if I just pack up my stuff and walk out of this house, I'll be, at least I'll be free of that. I won't have to worry about that. Um, it's not the right thing to do. Really um, I don't know how, you know, the, the more ways we can say it, the better. Stay, stay in your home, stay, keep your family together. Um, I think, um, you know, that's, that's really got to be the message. So it sounds like, uh, as you said, Michael, this is a uh, marketing challenge. Uh, what would certainly help is just uh, communicating through social media channels uh, because people pay attention to social media. Um, and uh, we will certainly at MDC post on our um uh, social media, including our own um, website, our homepage, um, information to direct folks and um, to you all. I think that is definitely um, something that this is, this is where you tweet. This is, <laughs> you make use of those 140 um, characters. So um, I think it's 140, I don't tweet. Um, <laughs> Yep. Follow us on social media to come up for Bono Community Lawyers. We're on yeah. Facebook and Twitter. I'm not good at tweeting either, but. <laughs> so someone asked um, if we will make it uh, a shareable. Um, so we will. Thank you for that, um, uh, Roxanne, who um, said whatever we post, we will make it so that it can be shared. And um, from one of our staff, I work for MDC, I get calls regularly from folks stating that they have to move because the landlord is selling the property and told them that they have to be out by the end of the month. I have to answer that. Um, a lot of landlords are um, taking advantage of that loophole in the moratorium to evict people and are not actually selling the property. Others are um, legitimately but it's a, it's a 60 day notice. Anybody who receives a 60 day notice should call us immediately. We will, we will go to court on those. I mean, because I'm, right now it's illegal to evict anybody. And if we find that there's no evidence that they're gonna actually do what they say they're gonna do, that's gonna get thrown out. Thank you, Lori. And this has been really a very good conversation. Um, sometimes we hit right at six o'clock. Sometimes we go over, but actually I've asked all of the questions that um, I've both been provided and I could just think of as we just went along in the course of the conversation. Michael and Lori, are there any other uh, things that you have thought about that you would like to share? Michael. Um, can I ask you, um, an NBC, MDC, how, how would you answer the question you've been posing, which is what, what do you expect to happen on July 1st? Well, if I didn't know that it actually takes time for um, people to be evicted and it's not like a three-day pay or vacate and, you know, your things are going to be thrown out. I mean, I could see why, how people might be thinking that if you didn't know. Um, I expect a lot more phone calls and a lot of people panicking. 
um, it's um, for whatever reason that people are behind on their rent, people know they're behind on their rent and it doesn't last forever. MDC is one of the mainline providers of services in this community. Whatever's gonna happen, you're gonna be on the front line of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, like THA, we are also a housing provider. We're yeah. a service provider and a housing provider. Um, as you mentioned at the opening, Michael, the advantage to folks who uh, reside in the properties that we uh, both have is that they are also connected to services and to folks who can give them um, correct information about uh, what additional supports they might receive, unlike someone who may be in a private unit and they are not at all connected. Yeah. Regardless though, like you said, we're going to be one of those first places people call. There's a good question in the chat asking whether an eviction would be a, a disadvantage to have on your record when you're looking for other housing. And the answer is yes. The most recent legislation softens that effect, but I think it still will count as a a weak mark in credit history. That's correct, yeah. I mean, we can have an eviction removed from your record in terms of how it's reported to reporting agency, the landlord reporting agencies, but um, as far as getting it off your your credit report, that's, that's more difficult and it will appear that. Yeah. That was a good question to ask though. And I'm glad that it was posed because there may be folks who are also thinking that. Um, had, I hadn't thought about that, but maybe folks are thinking I'll just save my money and I'm just going to go and uh, purchase a house and I'm just gonna hedge my bets on this will go through before anything shows up on my credit report. It's not the right way to go about um, moving through this process. Um, thank you for reading that, Michael. Lori, are there any additional things that you would like to say before I close us out? I think um, the main thing that we would like to get across, or at least the, one of the biggest things that's on my mind right now, because as you can tell, I'm still mind blown by the fact that we have, we actually have the ability to represent people in eviction hearings. Um, we used to do that um, like four days a week down at the courthouse. And it was like, we were standing there and we would grab people and say, you know, do you need help? I mean, they would have to ask us for help and we could help maybe two or three out of the 13 that were there. And it was always really rewarding because it was kind of on the spot, getting something done, getting extra days, getting rid of fines, um, maybe sometimes saving a tenancy. But it was like, oh my God, you know, we're only hitting 1%, you know, and now we have the ability to represent everybody who's eligible. And this, this is huge. It is really enormous. And I think we, we want people to trust that the system is there to help them. And I know people have a lot of reasons to think that it's not there to help them because the legal system is part of the systemic racism that we have in this country that we're all trying to fight. Mm -hmm. um, that's who we are. We have, to, we have to start doing it a different way. We got to do it right. So this is a big step in doing it right. And I want people to know that that's, um, that's happened. It's there. And we've, we've got something really working for us. So in the midst of all this, stuff that is so frightening to think about. That's, it's really a bright light. Oh, excellent point. You know, we always end with asking folks, where are you finding hope this week? I heard Michael's um, response and giving kudos to Tacoma Pro Bono and the Center for Dialogue and Resolution. Is there anything else that you would add to that, Michael? 
Pam, I'd like to thank you, Rob, and MDC. You've been leaders in this civic discussion and the community needed that leadership. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Lori. Repeat the question for me again. It's, it's, where are you finding hope oh, this week? I'm finding hope in, in people's energy. Um, our, our staff is growing like crazy, as I mentioned. Um, we're adding 12 attorneys. That's enormous for us. Um, so everything is changing and we're getting, um, we're getting a lot of really outstanding applicants. And this is a, it's a funny job market right now. Um, people can really pretty much go wherever they want. And it's, it, it, it's really interesting. But so we were thinking, oh my God, yeah, we can hire 12 attorneys, but where are they? Who's going to want to work for us? And we're getting people coming to us and saying, yeah, I want to, I want to do this. People are out there. They're not just looking to get a, a job that makes a lot of money. They're really looking to do stuff that helps people. And that's not always the case. So I'm, I'm feeling really, really hopeful that we've got a lot of good people going in to help solve these problems that you know, might not have been doing that before. It's making me feel that, Yeah, that is um, something to be, to find hope in. Thank you for, for that. How about you, Rob? Yeah, I would play off of what Lori said. I find hope that there's um, so many people, not just on this call, but in the community that are working on this issue and, um, and trying to provide a safe and hopefully um, prosperous off ramp to from this pandemic, from the eviction issues that have come with it. And that we um, hopefully create a new system going forward that overcomes and, uh, and steamrolls the systemic issues that have caused such dispro disproportionate impacts um, from COVID-19 and from the financial impacts of, of the pandemic. Yeah, I, I would say uh, lastly that for me, the ability for folks to reach out to the Center for Dialogue and Resolution and Tacoma Pro Bono, just as an example, is gives me hope because what I am hearing is that if you reach out, we will catch you. If you take that leap of faith, we will catch you. And that is definitely something to have hope, to be hopeful about, that we can mitigate that wave that we anticipate, regardless of the size, and that folks will get what they need so that they can remain housed. And as Michael so eloquently stated, um, we can minimize that ripple effect that could happen in our community. So I want to thank each of you again, and also Marilise, we know she had to jump off of the call, but I want to thank you both again for being part of this very important conversation. And Rob is going to post the phone numbers uh, so that everyone can see um, those numbers and reach out. Pierce County Rental Assistance, the Center for Dialogue and Resolution, and Tacoma Pro Bono. Please feel free to share this information. We will have it posted. Uh, as was asked, we'll make it a shareable and uh, just get this information out to the community. Again, Michael, Lori, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you all who joined into this conversation, whether you, it, you listened live, um, it was live streaming on Facebook, or you are just replaying the recording. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this important conversation. And everyone have a good evening. Good night.